I'm Keith McCullough, and welcome to another Real Conversation. It's my pleasure to have in studio Dave Greeley, who's the Chief Economist at ABAX. Welcome. Great to be here. Yeah, it's um, fantastic to see you in person. Yeah, we're um, we both live. We're just talking about we both we both live in the same town. We both live in we do in Westport. Yeah, Westport, Connecticut, and we didn't even know that. But for many of you that um, don't know him yet, I'm going to get to know him right now and go through his background and process as we would. Uh, partners with you know Caveman Crumb, Josh Crumb. I call him Caveman. Uh, he may or may not find that funny. Uh, but you know, you know, we have the the, the connection in terms of uh, a lot of different. Uh, players that are of that community, Stefan Weiler, um, you know, you guys worked with Curry at Goldman. That's right. That's where we all met up back in the day. Yeah, so that's your crew. Yeah, uh, those are my guys. But you, you've, you've taken, and maybe let's just start with that, with your background. I mean, um, it's an interesting path, anything that Josh works on. I mean, I'm always fascinated with it. He's so forward-looking, bigger picture, um, not really old wall. And it's what, what I find doubly fascinating is that all, that's where all you guys came from. But it was and still is widely considered one of the better places to work. If you're gonna work on, you know, on, on Wall Street, Goldman certainly would, would be at the top of the list. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, I got to Goldman in 2001, and I had gone to the University of Chicago, got my PhD in economics there, and that's actually where I met Jeff Curry. We, okay. were, we were roommates for a number of years back then. He went off to Wall like Street. Like your literal roommates in Literal college? roommates. Uh, okay. we'll, I'll save wow. those stories for another time. Wow. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so we were literal roommates. He went off to Goldman after graduation. I went and worked for the government in D.C. for four or five years. Oh, really? Worked at the uh, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation uh, as a research economist there. And then moved back up, you know, met up with Jeff again at Goldman when they were looking for an economist to bring in on the commodity side. At the time, Steve Strongen, another University of Chicago guy, was running the commodities group. And so we had a little University of Chicago mafia <laughs> going. And so it was a great, it was a great time to be there. You know, I got there in 2001. At that time, you know, buy the dip was the commodity market mentality. You had these kind of range bound markets for a number of years. And then soon after getting there, you had that big secular bull market in commodities that lasted through 2007, 2008. Um, so fantastic time for having to figure out why are markets behaving differently yeah. than they did for the prior 10 years. Mm -hmm. And that's when I met up with uh, Josh Crumb. So he was running metals research when I was running the energy research, both working with Jeff. And it was just a great time. Stefan Weiler, you know, yeah. worked for me, helped me do the energy research. So it was like, great. And then had the opportunity to meet back up with uh, Josh a couple years ago. Yeah. How, um, how many years did you were you at Goldman? Uh, I was at Goldman for about eleven years. Oh wow. Yeah. That's so, like dinosaur, man. Like it's a long time. It's old. There's a lot of gray, <laughs> a lot of snow on the roof, Keith. <laughs> well, the and then you went to Bridgewater. I did. Or, I did. Or, or, that was after Goldman, right? That was after okay. Goldman. So you know. I left Goldman around 2012, and commodity markets were moving into the doldrums. You mm -hmm. know, you had, of course, the big downturn with the financial crisis. You had a lot of commodity supply coming on with the shale revolution in natural gas and even oil production. And, you know, the markets kind of started to become less interesting. Mm -hmm. And I kind of discovered that the only thing uh, tougher than doing more with less is doing less with less. And the business was kind of contracting, wasn't as intellectually stimulating, had an opportunity to go work at Bridgewater as a portfolio strategist. Was pretty fascinated by their approach, mm -hmm. kind of research driven, but instead of just commodities, more global macro. Yep. And so it took the, the opportunity to uh, see what I could learn. Hey there, Hedgeye Nation, or if you're not part of Hedgeye Nation, thanks for watching Hedgeye on YouTube. If you haven't already, make sure to click on the button below there. Subscribe to our YouTube page. You can also follow the link in the description to our website to get even more great investing content. Is that why you live in Westport? That is why I live in Westport. Nice. I'm nailing it today. I'm getting nailed in the market today, but it's, um, it is, it's a really interesting, pl I mean, I always walk my dog by Bridgewater. I've never been in the building. There's so many people at Westport right. that I know from Bridgewater. And we, you know, we, we have a similar top-down approach. I'm not going to say I'm Ray Dalio or anything like that. Um, we do what we do, and you guys did what, or you did there what you did. It's, it's an interesting transition, though, I assume, where you're, because, guys, if you can show slide, I think, 48 in the macro deck, it's just a long-term chart of the dollar. Right. right. So, you know, the dollar hits a 40 year low in 2011. Commodities hit their super cycle highs. I mean, that was a very unique point in time for macro. Certainly not a time, uh, not a time to do nothing. Now, can you kind of walk through um, your experience with that? With you, because you lived through it. You had to coach people through it. Maybe the super cycle first and then what the other side of it looked like, because you end up on the buy side for the other side of it. Yeah. So, you know, for me, the you know, going through the super cycle itself, 
was fascinating, and this carried over a bit to Bridgewater as well, where I think a lot of people who don't have much of a research process behind their trading, they're kind of trading off their own experience and yep. what they've experienced through their lifetime. So, you know, what I learned at Goldman firsthand and, you know, what Ray always reinforced was you got to look beyond your own experience <clears throat> and see that things repeat in markets, maybe just not over your lifetime. So, uh, you know, in the oil market at Goldman in the 2000s, what we saw was one of these, you know, what Jeff always calls the revenge of the old economy, that you go through cycles. There are periods where there's a lot of underinvestment in basic infrastructure to pull commodities out of the ground. And over time, you don't have enough supply to keep up with demand and you need higher prices, more volatility because you don't have the infrastructure, the inventories to dampen that. And then that helps get the next wave of investment like we saw in shale in the US and then mm -hmm. you go into a low volatility period, which is kind of what we were doing in 2011, 2012. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of know, okay, ultimately that is gonna turn once again, it's turning now. But, you know, okay, what do you do in the interim? I decided to move out of the commodity markets for a while and see if that sort of mentality, you know, see how that was being applied at the global macro stage. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, I wasn't working on the research research side at Bridgewater, was more on working with clients. So part of that was helping them understand their portfolios. A couple things I took away was looking at your basic framework, understanding how to build a diversified, you know, what you call a beta portfolio, so that whether growth surprises to the upside or downside, inflation surprises to the upside or downside, you've got a pretty good diversified portfolio against fundamental shocks in the market. And then that you need a strong research process if you're going to produce alpha. Yep. So, you know, when you go through Westport and you see the buildings full of Bridgewater researchers, they're all hard at it every day. <laughs> and so it's a, little, it's a little humbling to realize, you know, the amount of effort that goes into producing, you know, real alpha over time. Yeah, the, um, uh, the, the cycle and the rhythm and rhyme of, you know, people, people really get fascinated with Dalio. He's done it, shown it with a cartoon. It's one of the more famous cartoons. Right. You know, but it's just the cycle, stupid. I mean, if you can stay with long term and intermediate term in your brain at the same time, you might have a chance. But, but I like yep. what you said, though, and a lot of people struggle with that, or will. Um, we'll see on the commodity side, but you said that they're, they're really hostage in many cases to their own trading experience. Like yeah. Quite often, you're, it's, it's like, where were you born onto Wall Street? Well, you, know, you were born onto Wall Street coming into a bull market in commodities. You know, I was born into a bear market in stocks, which was the other side of that. I didn't do commodities. Right. Uh, but that became a bull market in consumer because you know, we ended up having like, no, you couldn't invest in tech anymore. So it's like, it, I, think, I think a lot of investors have had the hum humility to say that. And I think Ray would say it himself. He always says like, look, I think it was 1982. He says his most embarrassing moment he ever had is, right. uh, was his best learning opportunity. Yeah, and it's always, right. am I brilliant or am I at the right time? Like when right. I came into commodities, I remember sitting on the floor at Goldman, it was right at the end of the tech boom, and watching person after person go into a corner office to be told that they didn't have a job anymore. Yeah. And it's like, okay, that wave's out, new wave in. And that was in 2001? 2001, the end yeah. of 2001. I, I was saying this today on the call, like we, we put our, and we'll get into your business and how you want to uh, build your community. One you know, cornerstone of ours is, is letting people listen to our morning meeting. Right. So you can imagine, uh, well, Ray would never let people listen to his morning meeting, uh, like externally, anybody, they could just tap in. Right. And I was saying to um, Andrew Friedman, who's our, our, our communications analyst, I said, I said, it was the year, this is very similar to the year 2001 in the sense that, because he's debating, well, where does the bottom, where does the tech stock bottom, mm -hmm. where does the bottom, where does the bottom? And every single analyst that I worked with, back then it was called Dawson Sandberg, it became Pequot, so it was you know, one of the bigger hedge funds. And I just saw one by one, people, same thing. Leaving, yeah. leaving, leaving. And it was really the beginning of a real estate investment cycle, commodity investing cycle, 2003. I remember John Dawson says to me, he goes, you're going to go to the PDAC. I go, what? The, PDA what? I mean, I'm a young single guy. I'm like, PDA. <laughs> like, I, it, you know, he's just like, you idiot. It's like a conference in Toronto. Mm. The Pro Prospectors Development Developers Association Conference. And I walked in there. I, I, could, I could swear that I was 15 to 25, 30 years younger than anybody. They're all hucking butts. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to get some edge here, at least right. with the companies, because there's nobody my age here. And that was kind of, that's what I, I look at now. Um, and maybe we'll just jump into that. I mean, is it, you know, it's going to be different. It always is different. But in the sense that there are no oil and gas analysts anymore on the street, or at least yeah, I don't know, what are, what are 95% of them are gone. Yeah. There certainly aren't, like, we have metals and mining analysts apply to Hedgeye all the time. I'm like, nope, nope, nope. Um, 
What do you think on that? Is it, is it just you know, the same old thing, or is it very, very different, but at the same time the same? Well, I think a little of both. So the things that are the same, right? you always go through these investment cycles. Right. And so, yes, lots of underinvestment in oil and gas. People look at how much money the oil companies have made the past year, look at how much they made the prior five years. Right. You, know, you can see why people weren't eager to put their money in. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, the, you know, the fact that there hadn't been a whole lot of volatility in commodity markets meant that you know, there wasn't a lot of people being trained as analysts. Mm -hmm. So you know, 10 years in financial markets is an eternity, right? Like that's a lost yes. generation in a way. <laughs> and you look, I mean, even look across the hedge fund space, like how many discretionary commodity managers are out there? You mm -hmm. could probably count them on two, three fingers. So I think there has been that kind of you know, loss of intellectual capital for understanding the markets. Um, and that takes a while to come back. At the same time, you know, you've got this cycle going through, similar to what we saw in 2008, but different in a number of really important ways. The first is, you know, if you think about, okay, what are the obstacles to getting the investment to happen this go around? I think there are a few. One is you're in a climate where, you know, no pun intended, you know, there's a big focus on the role of climate change and the role of fossil fuels, oil, natural gas, coal, uh, you know, in producing that climate change. So you've got this massive move to net zero commitments. Right now, and you've got over 700 of the biggest companies in the world have made net zero type commitments. Countries comprising about 90% of global GDP have made commitments. So if you're gonna move to net zero, that means you're gonna get rid of fossil fuels. So I'll give you an example, the IEA came out with a report on their path of how do we get to net zero globally by 2050. And what it pointed out was, okay, you're gonna use about 90% less coal. Mm -hmm. You're gonna use about 75% less oil. You're gonna use about 50, 55% less natural gas. Now, you can put that in perspective and say, okay, we've never used less of anything, and we're supposed to use less of everything. So there's a big hurdle to cross there. And the other is, if you're gonna invest in an oil project, gas projects, you know, you're looking at 20 years over a horizon to make a decent return on that. If you're being told, we're not using your product in 10 years, mm -hmm. you're not going to invest. So that's a big, you know, impediment to investing in this environment. And then the other, which is combined, is the mainstreaming of the ESG movement. And so there's, you know, we're doing a series on our podcast about how do we finance this energy transition. And I think that one of the other impediments has been probably ill-applied ESG. Mm -hmm. So there's ways to do it well, there's ways where it just acts as a constraint. Um, you know, we can get into, if you look at the energy transition, you know, how are we gonna do this thing that is the biggest thing, I would say, humanity has ever tried to do? Mm -hmm. So we've got an energy system that we've been building for the past 150, 200 years, you know, since we had coal-fired steam engines, uh, and we're trying to replace that in several decades with a whole new unproven energy system based on low carbon renewables. That's an awfully big thing to try to do. Um, you know, IEA says it's $120 trillion of investment by 2050. You know, and then you got people like miners like uh, Robert Friedland saying, yeah, we just don't have the copper to do it. Hmm. So there's a whole lot going on there. Um, but you know, it's the big thing that's facing us. So I think when you look out at this cycle, you know, the fact that we're not only trying to build out energy infrastructure, which is what we were doing in the 2000s, now we're trying to completely replace the entire energy system that we have. And that is a much bigger deal. Yeah, that to me, I mean, both of those things, first of all, it started, you know, the biggest problem is that it starts with governments assuming that they have the answer. You know, so the premise is we have to do this, and the process is TBD. Right. You know I mean, so those two things, that's like anti-Ray Dahlia. You know, it's anti how history would think of not only, you know, the cycle as we're, as we're discussing it, but the human life cycle. I mean, it's just not, I mean, how much can that be completely screwed up, you know, with a 20-year cap on it? I mean, and, 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 and I hear it more and more and more. You, more of our clients will say, that was a disaster. This is where it's at. It's not 20 years. You should be investing in traditional energy that can convert and evolve, right. et cetera, et cetera, because they're going to have the cap. They're going to actually have the cash flow. They're going to have the capital to do it. Yeah, I think when you look at it, 
Um, there's a few things. One is, you know, there's the climate problem, and then there's the energy problem. And so, you know, the climate problem is very debatable. Though. Like a lot of people, you know, that there's still like it's not like everybody has to believe that it's the same answer to the problem, right? Right. Well, there's the thing of do you believe that carbon emissions are having a negative effect on the climate? Most people agree. Yeah. So if you believe Does anybody that, anybody not agree? Well. I'm glad to hear that you're <laughs> not one of those, because I am not the climate scientist to have that fight. But yeah, so, okay, if you can believe that, you know, the industrial scale of the emissions we're putting out. So if you look at fossil fuels, it's something like 30, 35 billion tons of CO2 from just fossil fuels every year. So we're filling up the space we have <laughs> in the atmosphere <laughs> for that, and that has impacts. But at the same time, you know, we want our energy system to be environmentally responsible, because we all live here, mm -hmm. but we also need it to be affordable and reliable. And so I think the, the, the problem that we're wrestling with and what we've been trying to get people focused on is those two things can be true at the same time, and your solution has to meet the needs of both. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to make it environmentally responsible, and you need it to be reliable and affordable, and that's not easy. So I think often, you know, when you see, you know, certain government policymakers get up and say, well, it's easy, we're just going to ban X, Y, and Z and do this, that, and the other. Okay, but what's that going to do to affordability? What's that going to do to reliability? It's going to make it terrible because we're not putting the dollars and the investment to build out that new infrastructure in time to replace the one we've got. I think as much as, uh, as, as many as you can find that would agree with the conclusion on something's changing, climate, et cetera, I agree. Most would agree that affordability and reliability just hit a new, new low. Absolutely. And right. I think what you're seeing uh, you know, happen in Europe over the past year or two in terms of energy is you know, a little bit of the, the warning shot of you know, what happens if we do this wrong. You know, what happens if you, you know, even before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, you, know, you go back a winter or two, and Europe was already having problems due to shutting down coal-fired plants, shutting down um, a lot of their access, being overly reliant on renewables that hadn't been built up to the scale that was needed yep. to provide reliable energy. And then, of course, you had the Russian invasion. Things became much worse. So I think the, the problem is for people who want energy to be re environmentally responsible, you're never going to get that unless it's also affordable. Mm -hmm because the moment energy prices go up, the moment you're closing small businesses, the moment people are cold in the winter, um, responsibility goes out the window. It's too long term, right? People aren't gonna worry about what happens in 10 years or 50 years if they're cold today. Well, isn't it amazing though, like how ironic or not that that, that in and of itself is the cycle too? I mean, people could believe in anything, rainbows, puppy dogs, FTX, yeah. Uh, crypto this, that, uh, the, new, the new structure of ESG, until the economy started to slow. And then as the economy entered a recession, it's, just not, it's not just like what happened in Russia. Yeah. You know, this affordability and reliability becomes like a, forget net zero. I mean, GDP goes to zero in countries or negative. You're going to have yeah. these issues anyway. It oh, just so I, happened that Putin you know, hit the fast forward button on a European recession that was going to happen. Right. Yeah, we were all going to get there. And it's one of the reasons I always love being involved in commodity markets is it's very real. Like yeah. you see it. Is there enough? You know, is there enough oil, yes. enough barrels, enough tons to take the economy where it needs to be? And I think hopefully, you know, what comes out of what we're seeing in markets now is we get a little bit more back to reality and a little bit more focused on some of the real issues. Well, I mean, is it, though, for the let's just take the cycle time, like the next two to three quarters, which I call quad four. So you get the rate of change right. of growth and inflation slowing at the same time, but inflation slowing to a very high level. You know, guys, if you show slide 15, I mean, going like today, it's like a joke. Today, everyone's like, I gotta buy tech stocks <laughs> because the PPI went from 8.3 to eight. Right. I mean, eight or the CPI, the corollary to that, going from nine to, to five, it was still a two and a half bagger over the prior cycle high. Yeah. So how do you think about the commodity component of inflation the base rate, like in our outlook, the best you can get is to five. You know, on CPI, right. you, you can use PPI however you want to use the answer. But this, the new start to the affordability reliability answer is, is from a much different base rate. Yeah. So how does that work? 
Well, I think there's like a new term that people are starting to learn, um, which is demand destruction, which, you know, if you go back a year, people were learning supply chain. And you're seeing yeah. demand destruction. And I think people need to internalize that demand destruction is actually a bad thing. It's actually no a sign that, you know, we have failed. So you look at Europe and say, oh, we can get through the winter. There's been lots of demand destruction. Like, no, that's a means, that's a failure. And so when you look at, you know, say commodity prices, commodity investing, when we look at the supply side, what we can see is there is not enough to run the economy at a normal rate of growth right now. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the commodities that we're going to need to come anywhere near affecting this energy transition, we have nowhere near the product pipeline to meet those needs. So, you know, on our podcast, Smarter Markets, we had Dan Jurgen on mm -hmm. right after S&P put out their report on copper. And they looked across all the scenarios. So, you know, if you're going to be transitioning the energy system, you're going to need, you know, everybody likes copper from a cyclical basis, right? Because Dr. Copper and what's happening in China, all that. But longer term, you know, if you're going to transition to an electrified economy, it's all copper. You need it for the wires, you need it for your electric yep. vehicles, everything. And what they found was even under, you know, okay, things working pretty well, you're short like 20% what you would need. Now, when I was doing commodities analysis, if you were short a few percent, <laughs> you'd get pretty bulled up. Like 20% is off the chart. And it's not just copper. You can look across the spectrum, you know, whether it's nickel for batteries, lithium for batteries, graphite, you know, lots of arithmetic that shows that this doesn't add up. So very bullish from that perspective and kind of bearish from the perspective of are we actually going to get to affect this energy transition we're trying to do. So in terms of the market, you know, what you always have then is, if you're in this demand destruction zone, is it gonna be by prices doing it or by the economy doing it? Mm -hmm. And so you know, that was the trouble trying to you know, call markets in 2007, 2008, was if the economy held together, prices would be much higher. You know, Goldman was famous for its you know, 150, 200 calls. What happened? The economy fell apart first. And I think that's what you're, the zone we're into now is, does the economy fall apart? Does the Fed say, yep. you know, we just got to get that inflation down by putting as much pressure as we need to on the economy? Um, otherwise, the supply is not there and the yeah, price I mean, has the, to the do the The economy, I mean, it's concomitant. You, you have a, a setup in 08 and this year for that matter where there's an explicit real consumption growth slowdown that's tied to the oil price. Like yeah. 11 of the last 12 recessions were predicated on a pre-oil right. you know, oil spike. So. Yeah, that's really that's really my question on like when we get to the other well, we're not even on the other side. We're entering yeah. a global recession. Oil today, unless I mean just I'll just use the IEA numbers, but I mean it's like lowest level of supply since like oh four yeah. and oil price is down like six percent, seven percent in the last week on the news. I mean, you have to ask yourself something about demand destruction. Yeah. No, and I think if you look at it, you know, what I hear people who are, you know, more involved in calling the markets and trading them day to day than I am right now is, you know, you're kind of waiting for that next cycle to pick up yep. because, okay, like it's a little dangerous to try to position now because it's all kind of a call on where the economy is going. But the next time we try to come out of this cycle, whether it's China reopening, whether it's, you know, the Fed eventually pivoting, getting inflation down, whatever, you know, the supply is not going to be there. Mm -hmm. And then it's off to the races. Which is interesting. I mean, like um, all these government people and they've earned their stripes on being criticized for transitory inflation. Yeah. But, um, I mean, government should get every level of credit for ESG and policies associated with ESG to create these capex holes. I mean, it's not like the, the inflation just came out of money printing. Well, some of both, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's, it's everything. <laughs> it's yeah. actually bad monetary policy and bad ESG policy. Yeah, and I think what we have is like, it's a very inconsistent policy as well. Well, right? they don't so even you, talk to each other. <laughs> yeah, and so that's the trouble because what do investors not like? They don't like uncertainty more than anything. And I think the policy environment's created a whole lot of uncertainty for people doing long-term investments that'll actually bring supply and demand and balance over the long term. And that's something that I think you know, that's, that's the biggest thing we hear from the folks we talk to is if you could get some level of policy certainty, mm. there'd be a lot more room to deal with these issues. And so some of what we've been trying to do is just get those conversations going among the market. I mean, we're market-based people. Yep. And so trying to get that conversation of, okay, what do we need so that we can avoid disaster? Mm -hmm. Because we're trying to do these two things at the same time, which is to yep. provide environmentally responsible energy at the same time, keeping it affordable for people. Well, this is, I mean, this is um, the next topic I wanted to hit on, which is you guys are focused on smarter markets on building that community. We have 
this is our mission. Um, yeah. It's a learning community. You have to unlearn a lot of bullshit before you can actually learn something. Then all of a sudden you're learning that things are changing. And as Dahlia would say, you're constantly learning from your mistakes. But it, it's like for me, I mean, I'm very comfortable saying I have no idea. Um, but listening to a community that's trying to find the answer is much more palatable than you know, asking some person in government that's not even, there's no plan, there's no process. It's like I said, TBD, I mean, there's no, is there even a hope on this side of hell that there's, that, that there's somebody in government that triangulates it all and creates a community inside the government to make it clear? Yeah, it's not, and it's not clear that even if they did, would the political environment enable them to carry it through? Um, right, you, you got two to four years. Yeah, and you've you got to get to the next hard. election, and how are you going to, yeah, exactly. <laughs> We had um, Bill Perkins, you know, Skylar Capital on the podcast uh, about a month or two back, and he was talking about, you know, traders, you try to survive, you know, to the yeah. next cycle. So you know, always, you're always in the game in a way. And I think it's the same thing for politicians. Like, you might know, yeah, we need a 20-year plan. Okay, I got my election in two years or, you know, a month from now. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of difficulty there. And that's why we're trying to do you know, a similar thing to what you're doing. I think you try to build the community. Um, for us, it's, hey, these are problems that we think are important. We want to have conversations with open-minded people that are willing to collaborate about mm -hmm. them, try to get lots of perspectives, try to figure out where there's some room to come up with good solutions, and then try to push those into the marketplace. Well, that's the next problem. It's like, here I am, and if Crum was here, he and I would quick, quickly agree the answer wasn't the Fed on monetary policy. Right. But if it's on energy transition policy, Am I asking for like some government guru? I wouldn't be. I mean, it's a market-based answer, market-based solution, let things succeed and fail. Um, is that what you guys are talking about? Or do, would you envision having in the future state, you know, President DeSantis supports, uh, you know, <laughs> appoints a new uh, equivalent of the Federal Reserve for ESG. I mean, right. I, I have no idea. Yeah, no, that would not be my, <laughs> that would not be my preference, if you can tell by my background. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I always go back to, like, I love, you know, the, the economist me going back to Hayek, you know, and he talked about what is an economy trying to do? An economy is trying to adjust to the big changes in the environment. Yeah. And, you know, why is decentralization powerful? It's because it's distributing knowledge down to the people who can make a difference. Mm -hmm. And so each one of us kind of understands the, our own specific conditions, our own, you know, the, what he would call, you know, the circumstances of time and place. And so if you can get the information down to people and allow them to make decisions, making the trade-offs in their own lives, then you can affect great outcomes. Like, I love markets because they're a way to coordinate people acting together, mm -hmm. right? To me, government is more top-down, as you said. It's like, okay, we're going to put all the information up to the top of the pyramid, they're going to issue orders, and then all the people at the bottom follow it. Mm -hmm. In a market, it's still collaborative, but it's not a pyramid. It's, you know, you have a price signal that's saying, hey, this is the next best use for this somewhere out there. You know, if you think your use of it's better than that, go buy it. Mm -hmm. If not, don't. If you can supply it into the market at a cost lower than that price, do it. And you get this tremendous groundswell of activity mm -hmm. mediated by the price. And so what we did, you know, coming into this cycle, and, you know, Josh is the visionary behind it, was looked at the commodity markets and said, well, what's different this cycle? Well, the whole commodity landscape is changing, yep. right? The commodities that are going to power the future are probably going to be a lot different from the ones we've used over the past 30 mm -hmm. years. But all our market infrastructure, you know, whether it's exchanges, whether it's, you know, the markets themselves are built around fossil fuels. So mm -hmm. how do we build markets for battery metals, build markets for LNG, build markets for carbon, so that people, you know, you can create this market, because markets just don't happen, mm -hmm. right? Like people have to build them, you have to create them, you have to make sure that they're regulated, you need to make sure that the price is trustworthy. Which is, which happens. I mean, there is a guy named Ray Dalio who built the tips market. Yeah. You know, it's not like, it's like, okay, I need a solution. I can't be long duration. Like, I, I argue that, that all that is is a plug, but I mean, so that you're not long duration and you could beat whoever's long duration. But, you know, I, I love that idea by Crum and how you, how you just articulated it. In particular, I was saying this before we went live here, um, in trading, like, carbon. You know, yeah. carbon pricing, car can, we, can, we, can we walk through carbon credits? Like, this market to me, I'm, as everybody probably knows, if you followed me more than a year, I'll trade, I'll trade anything. 
and know nothing about a lot of them, right. other than my price volume volatility signal and where we are in the cycle. And for me, that's actually pretty much what I need to know. Uh, if I have to explain to clients why, that's where I get into trouble. Because right. I'm not, I, I don't know shit on you know, carbon markets or carbon pricing. But um, KRBN, which trades actively, I know exactly what to do with that. And isn't it amazing that I'm, I'm telling you I, d I don't know why? <laughs> <laughs> it happens more often than you would think. I knew an oil trader once, who's, I, they described it as, um, you know, the Brent market functions pretty well as long as you don't think about it too hard. Yeah. You know, because no one actually knows what's in it. Um, <laughs> so it's not, not like special to carbon. But I think the carbon markets, you know, for one, they're important. And they could easily become one of the largest markets that we have. You so think? if you think about, really? oh, yeah. yeah. Because if you think about it, everything we do is emitting carbon, um, you know, in terms of fossil fuels. So it touches not only the oil market, which is a massive market, it touches natural gas, it touches coal, you know, it's throughout the spectrum. It touches agriculture. Um, so when we think about carbon markets, I think there's a few things that, you know, are important to keep in mind. One is, you know, from a high level, why do we need a carbon market? I mean, one is because right now, we can pump as much carbon dioxide as we want to in the air, and it's free. Mm -hmm. So anything free, you do a lot of it. So we need to create a price that reflects the impact it's having overall on all of us, you know, in terms of higher temperatures and the impacts from that. So how do you create that price? Well, kind of the classic economic solution is you put a cap on the amount that's allowed to be emitted, and then you allow trading. Mm -hmm. So we have some compliance markets that are like that, the European ETS is the, you know, the most well-established. So there the government has said, okay, there's a cap. If you want to emit carbon, you need to get a certificate, like for the industrial users that are in the pool. And then we'll allow so many credits each year. And then you can trade them amongst yourselves. So you know, if you've got a certificate, but you think that you can cut back your own emissions uh, cheaper than what it's selling for in the market, you just sell your certificate to somebody else. So you have a cap and trade policy and there are carbon certificates and I'm just trading a call on the, on the certificate. Right, so you can just- On somebody else's certificate. So you can just trade the certificate, right? But you I can can't buy and sell own them? them. You can own them. Um, I mean, you have to get into the, the weeds of it, but there are people that will buy them and just retire them. So if you think that I believe that the, there's too much emissions being put out, I could buy a certificate and never use it. Right. And this is kind of like a tried and true economic solution, yeah. like we've seen. I mean, that was a big part of getting acid rain under control in the 1980s was cap and trade systems. What makes it harder in carbon is that unlike acid rain, which is very regional, you know, so the sulfur dioxide and nitrous oxide goes up out of the smokestack, it filters down over the region around it, you know, you could build these coalitions of governments around the affected areas that could agree to a cap. Carbon dioxide, it goes around the whole planet. It's up there for, yeah. you know, a thousand years. So you need like a global answer and getting a global answer is difficult. I mean, getting an answer just in one region is tough enough. And so what you had is these other markets come up which are called voluntary carbon markets, which are really driven not by a government saying you need to cap it, but driven by the net zero commitments that corporations have made. Mm -hmm. So if I'm a corporation and I have a, a carbon footprint and I've told my stakeholders that I'm gonna reduce that closer to net zero, well, I can do that in part by improving my own practices, but it might be I get to a point where I can't get any more efficiencies out of my own process. And so, well, what if I invest in a carbon reduction project somewhere else? Ah, so you get a netting of, you know, the so, yeah, yeah, so instead of doing it myself, I hire a project developer to reforest. You know, to plant forests, those trees capture carbon. Hmm. I do, you know, distribute cook stoves like we do with our base carbon company. And that makes a much more efficient use of the fuel being used to cook and heat in many countries. So that reduces their carbon output. So, you know, the carbon market enables me, the corporation that's made a net zero commitment, to use the benefits of that project against my own carbon footprint to offset it. Mm. So for me, I think the important thing with the, the carbon markets, especially the voluntary ones, is to be focused on the projects themselves. Yep. People often get caught up in, oh, it's this credit, it's a whitewash. Like, yeah, you can go out and buy some really bad stuff. Like there are poor quality credits floating around, but I'm sure you could go onto your screen and find lots of poor quality stuff floating around the financial markets. So people have to use their, you know, put on their investment acumen, do their due diligence. But I think the important thing is, you know, it's a way of getting capital 
two projects, a lot of it from developed countries to you know, developing countries, so that you can reduce the carbon footprint globally in the interim while the government's not doing it. Well, you have a very, that's really interesting, I mean, from a longer term perspective, because if your net zero just ensures that you're, you're capping you know, any oversupply, right. then the only thing you have, to, I mean, there are a lot of things you have to worry about in markets, but a big one isn't one of the things you have to worry about in, in every other commodity market that I've ever traded which is an oversupply. Right, so on the compliance markets, the government set the supply, yeah. and then on the voluntary markets, you know, it's really, it's the stakeholders. So that can also be a good part of ESG, where if you, you know, people, investors go to their companies they own and say, look, we think it's important that yeah. you're not emitting, and then they become the ones who enforce it, in a way, by looking at it and say, okay, did you do a good quality project or did you do a bad quality project? And bad quality doesn't count. So the, the big bang against, you know, the, where you absolutely blow up is if, you had, I'm just making it up, but again, if you had President DeSantis or any president of consequence who came in and said, it's all bullshit, we're not capping any of this anymore. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, <laughs> I mean, that's <laughs> and that's a little bit what happened with the first round of carbon markets in the 2000s. Oh, it did? Was, I didn't know. Yeah, there were a lot of, you know, Chicago Climate Exchange, like this is round two. So, you know, guys we have on our team were around for the first round in like 2000, kind of post-Kyoto carbon yeah. markets. So a lot of that infrastructure was built and then it went away. And a big part of it is what you said, you know, the Republicans taking Congress, you know, in the Obama midterms kind of put an end to the fact that, oh, these markets are going to become compliance markets. So a lot of people were investing at that point thinking, okay, we'll get ahead of the curve, and then these voluntary markets will become compliance markets. And when that went away, the, the, the strength went away. But there was a lot of good done. So if you look, you know, when we look at the voluntary carbon markets, you know, we think a lot of what it does is it kickstarts the new technology that you're going to need. So for example, if oh, you really? go back okay. to the 2000s, like solar wasn't economic, wind wasn't economic. Mm -hmm. Today, solar and wind are very economical, yeah. you know, at the scale they're being done. And so if you, you know, if you were trying to get a carbon credit because you're investing in solar, no one's going to, well, no one legitimate is going to really issue you one because it's already economic. You don't need the carbon financing mm -hmm. to do it. But what carbon financing can do is get those new technologies kind of over the hump and starting to scale up so that you can get the economy of scale that you need. Yeah, I was just looking at this um, while you're speaking in, in, in explaining this to me, really. Um, there's this European Carbon Allowance ETF. So if I'm betting on Europe doing what I just said, DeSantis won't do anyway, but th th that's a stupid bet. I mean, so that to me would be, okay, whatever they're allowing, whatever these certificates are, that upward sloping trend, that's something that I can yeah. trade with a bullish bias. I mean, it's, I'd never been able to, I mean, in the last cycle, they never had ETS for every bloody thing that, it, that, that could be. Right. right. There you get into some dicey, I was just looking at the California, you know, carbon allowance ETF. I mean, they're, they're, they're new to me. Okay. And it new is, is good because <laughs> trading cattle futures isn't fun. Right. You know? <laughs> Cause new being, I, you know, I look for, as I'm sure, um, was the, I shouldn't say sure. I don't know. Um, but capital seeks falling volatility and it loathes rising volatility. <laughs> so you see a longer term trending and lower volatility across. If I take a, um, if I take all the crane shares, uh, carbon ETFs, cause they'll have right. a whole bunch of them. And I just put them in a basket, run it through my price volume, volatility signal, vol of vol is downward sloping. It's bullish mm -hmm. for the price. Right. Right. So I'm like, okay, what is this? Uh, like it, quite, quite literally it could be cattle futures and I would buy it. And then look at it and say, okay, yeah, I've got it screened. Now I'm going to dive in and yeah. So yeah. you're saying that the, the the intermediate to longer term, the structural setup for that is sound. Yeah. So if you look, you know, intermediate longer term. So the compliance markets. You know, we've had a couple of great interviews with a member of our you know extended network, Mark Lewis, who's head of climate research at Pierre Andorans okay. Capital. So I don't know if anybody knows the European ETS system better than him. Um, but yeah, I think you know what he would say is uh, you know the there, the supply reductions are built into law. So very difficult to unwind. And I think what you're seeing is more and more places, you know, the kind of the knock on a lot of climate commitments are, ah, people just won't, won't make them. They'll just break right. them when it comes to it. I think this has been a good test of the EU ETS system because, you know, yeah, they've had to go and put on coal-fired power plants. So it's making it more bullish, you know, down the road because you're using up allowances now that you could have had in the future. But that system's still holding you know, right now. Um, and if you look at a lot, even the voluntary markets with the corporate commitments, 
a lot of those corporate commitments are increasingly being built in, you know, as a liability by the SEC. Mm. So like you put a like, corporate commitment to net zero on your, you know, your corporate statements, like you got to certify that the same way you would your financial statements. Right. And so it becomes much harder. It's no longer just marketing, it's moving into operations <laughs> and the rest of the C-suite. So like, yeah, I think that the, the thing that's worrisome for the whole thing though, is the free rider problem, that because it's a global problem, you know, if one massive country like the US, like China, you know, just decides to say, ah, we're opting out, then the planet doesn't get to net zero. And so that's, that's the tension of how do you keep everybody, you know, moving towards this. Mm -hmm. That's um, it's a fascinating development over the long term where people, you know, and especially if they're making money on it, it it's self-reinforcing. I mean, I want this to work. Even if I am anti-climate change, I, well, I've got an asset allocation to, to my carbon credits, and that's, and that's working yeah, out Yeah, and I think it's like a different way of looking at the world, right? Where yeah. it's, you know, I don't think, I've got teenage kids, you know, I know that humans can have a negative impact on their environment. <laughs> you know, <laughs> at the scale that we're emitting carbon, like that's a negative impact. Like people, we all live here, we wanna make sure that it's pretty good. And so this is just ways to do it. Yeah, and I think, like you know, it, it's, it's a big fight to keep it out of the, for me, when people focus on the credits themselves, that's where it gets a little worrisome. Just look through, look at the projects being done. Yeah, that's a really good point. So I'm gonna, now I'm, at least I'll know what to look, look for other than price, volume, and volatility. <laughs> one more to add, one more to add. If you have questions, by the way, uh, Dave's gonna take them. Uh, the questions will be voted up or down. They're starting to come in. I have one more before we go to the queue here. Um, time's flying here, Dave, when, you're, when I'm learning uh, stuff. Mismatch between um, all those minerals that are out there in the world that have always been there uh, and and you know, metals and minerals. What's what, what, what do you guys think on that front? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the energy transition, there's an incredible mismatch. So you know, told you a little bit about the the you know conversation we had with Dan Jurgen. I think Robert Friedland of Ivanhoe Mines has been a big champion of this point. So we had him on the podcast again over the summer. He is that guy is a trip. He but is in, in 2002, 2003. Like when I said I went to the PDAC in Toronto. Right. This guy, first of all, he's one of the first Canadian billionaires coming out of that. Uh, but this guy was like made, maybe even Elon look calm. He, he, he was, he's a trip, that guy. He's still he's, kicking around. He's great, he's great. And How I think old he's, is that guy now? More, I don't know, I, probably looks younger than me. Yeah. So, <laughs> but I'm he's sure he's not. He's full of energy, this guy. Yeah. And he's seen the world so many times. Over. And he calls it, you know, he calls it. So yeah. um, one of the things I loved, I heard him um, speaking at the FT Commodity Summit in February, and he gave a great keynote. And one of the things he brought up, you know, just to kind of put a lot of this energy transition uh, need for metals and the shortfall in perspective, he'll tell a story where he just brought on a new copper mining complex in Africa. You know, community involved, hydro powered. He's been working on it since late 1990s. Yeah. You know, and now it's going to probably be the third, maybe second, maybe third uh, largest m copper mining complex in the world. Amazing. Yeah. So terrific. Um, but he's been working on it for 25 years. Yeah. And then you say, okay, if we're gonna have enough copper to meet the demand that we need for the energy transition, you know, he's like, okay, you need to bring on two or three of these every year. Wow. And it's like, well, okay, but we haven't been working on two or three of these back over 25 years. So I think there's this, there's this you know, powerful arithmetic that's not being done. Yeah. So you've got a lot of policy, a lot of ambition, a lot of enthusiasm, but then you, you bring it back to the commodity guys to pour cold water, I guess, because they're the ones who are looking and counting the barrels, counting the, the tons of metal we have, and saying, look, we don't have it. Right. So you wanna go everything EV? Okay, that's a lot of batteries. Mm -hmm. Do you have the components for the batteries? No, well, we don't. You yeah, know? our industrials analyst done a really good job, Jay Van Skyver's done um, just, just the arithmetic on lithium required. If, if we're going yeah. to electrify, then this is what it's going to require. This is what supplies. It's a trip. It's almost trivial, especially if you don't want to take it from the Chinese. Right. You know, th there's a lot of that. And it changes the whole energy, like the whole energy security equation too, right? Because so much of that metal goes through China for processing. And then even if you just take copper as an example, and I think copper, about 40% of current production comes from two countries, hmm. Chile and Peru. You know, if you look at OPEC plus, they're about 10% of the oil market. So, okay, you got 40% of supply coming out of two countries. Like that's a very different energy security when metal security, you know, is now energy security. Isn't it amazing that like the last super cycle, it's, it's if you didn't have bricks emblazoned in your 25 year old head, i.e. me, 
uh, you weren't doing it right, right. Particularly given that it was a Goldman acronym. Um, and now your super cycle is like global electrification or something much different, right? You know, it's not this Chinese yeah, absolutely. post WTO. And we've been calling it like, you know, talking in terms of plan A and plan B. So like plan A that everyone agrees on, right, is we're going to electrify everything and we're going to power it by low carbon renewables. Yep. Done. And then it's okay, but if we don't have the metals to do that, <laughs> to do that. Yeah, like that's... what happens then? Because if we yeah. do believe that not transitioning is a problem and then transitioning poorly leads to energy crises and that's a problem, like what's plan B? Yeah, this like is, what are we going to do? This is where coming out of a what we call global quad four recession mm -hmm. where demand can really wreak havoc on your long book. Right. Uh, just look at anything that we, we used to be long that we went short. And now it's getting increasingly more difficult to be short copper because the signal's changing for reasons that you've probably mentioned many. You never know why. There's not right. just one reason why. But, you know, going into what we call global quad two from the from the lows of the pandemic, mm. we made a pile on like anything rare earths, the most obscure thing. Right. That's not even obscure. Yeah. But I mean, the next time, you're gonna have an ETF for every single thing, right down to every single manifestation of carbon carbon tax credits. Right. Well, hopefully, because you know what we're doing and what we're doing with you know our futures exchange that we're launching in Singapore is trying to create markets right. so that people can invest and that yeah. capital for people like yourself that look forward and say, hey, there's not enough lithium, there's not enough nickel. Well, how are we gonna get enough lithium? How are we gonna get enough nickel? It's gonna take producers, miners like Robert who can invest and build out those new mines and hopefully do it in a, an environmentally responsible way. And they're gonna do a lot of those projects, they're gonna finance them by laying off risk in the futures markets. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really- To secure financing. And if those futures markets don't exist, the investment doesn't happen. Right. Well, so. that that's a, I mean, talk about forward looking by you guys. I mean, that's that's phenomenal. I, I'm trying to think of where he almost had me go. He had me, um, is it Olyu Togoy, maybe in Mongolia or something like that? He had some massive. Like, oh, this was Robert? Robert. He's like, you got to go there. Oh, okay. Now I don't like, know that one. I don't know if I, I want to go there. <laughs> but it was, and it, lo and behold, you know, this massive, the guy just creates these massive um, projects and, um, uh, yeah, you know, big big capitalist he is. Um, I'm going to go to the first question that has the most upvotes. Um, okay, here, uh, Dave. Good to see you as the interviewee. <laughs> 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 yeah, I don't think of these, by the way, as interviews, guys. Like I think of I think of this as what I call it, a conversation, a real conversation, where I'm learning something. I don't know if that's how you take away your from your takeaway from. Your I podcast. try to always just say I want a great conversation, but I will thank you now sitting on this side because I know how hard it is to fit on, sit on the host side and have a great conversation. So thank you for doing it so well, I'm <laughs> picking up pointers as I sit here. <laughs> cool. Well, Dave, uh, Dave is asking Dave, so Dave's uh, happy about that. Um, we heard the federal government can't print oil, but then we saw them do just that and drive down the price. <laughs> How does the entrenched intervention mentally distort the commodity and energy cycle that you expect is coming? Yeah. So, you know, in terms of the SPR in particular, right, you can't draw on it forever. So I think what that shows is you can get through an election cycle, you can get through a particularly tough time. And what the SPR was designed for was, mm -hmm. you know, if you're in a war, if there's a real crisis. Um, so drawing it down just sets a stage for a more bullish future, right? Because yeah. that's one less shock absorber we've got in the system. And so I think that's the way to look at it. You know, we always looked at uh, inventory levels and spare capacity. Yes. Like that's your shock absorber. If you're out of those, you're in demand destruction, and that's either the economy cracks or price goes to the moon until somebody pulls back. And so if you look across a lot of commodities right now, inventories look very low for us, yep. you know, having come out of COVID not very long ago. Like mm -hmm. to see commodities at this low at this point in the cycle is something and the spare capacity, you know, looks more or less non-existent, mm -hmm. especially when you take all the Russian commodity supply out of the market as well to some extent. So, you know, yes, the, the government's trying to pull the levers. I think long term, you know, bigger than the SPR, would be how much is government keeping us from doing the investment that we need? Mm -hmm. Because you know the next time the cycle turns up, if those oil fields aren't available, the natural gas isn't available, the LNG isn't available, then you've got a real problem because mm -hmm. the economy simply can't grow. What do you think? What do you think about LNG? Um, we really see it as kind of one of the most interesting markets out there, in that 
Um, you know, when I was at Goldman in the 2000s, we started doing European gas research. And um, gas, gas likes to flow through pipelines, right? Like that's the easy way. Yep. So you had very regional markets. You had the US market, which is probably the economist's dream of a competitive market. You had the European market, which was this kind of interesting collection of competitive markets and contracts for buying gas. And then you had a very contract linked market in Asia, uh, but very regional. And what we've seen with LNG being able to, you know, cool down gas so that you can put it on a ship and move it so you don't have to be in a pipeline, is that's created a global gas market. Mm -hmm. And that global gas market, you know, is terrific on a number of levels. One, it's another shock absorber to the system. So if you look at Europe, if Europe hadn't been able to pull in the record amounts of LNG it's pulled in, that crisis would wow. be so, so much worse. Now that said, it's not great if your gas is someone else's shock absorber. Right. So it's helped Europe, but it's helped lift prices a little bit in the U.S. Exactly. You know, the U.S. is now the biggest LNG producer or exporter in the world, sending it to Europe. But if you're sitting in Southeast Asia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, other people that were going to be competing and expecting to use that gas, you're having power outages now. So it's like, okay, we avoided power outages in Europe, but we created them for poorer countries. And I think that's something we're always worth keeping in mind. When you have an energy crisis, the market always balances yep. on the backs of the poor mm -hmm. because they're the ones who run out of money first, that's obviously. Terrible, isn't it? it's, it's in it. And now, um, well, I could get into the whole monetary component of that via their currency, but uh, it's for a different discussion. Um, okay, here's, um, I knew we had a question. Yeah, we do have a question from a farmer, Arnie. Uh, Arnie Hinkson, as a Midwest corn and soybean farmer, I'm mixed on the new bubbling of carbon schemes. There you go, Hinkson. This is, this is what I was thinking, you know, like one day it's all fun and games for me to trade these bloody ETFs and carbon and then I get smoked. Um, you know, because they could be schemes. I mean, we just saw the mother yeah. of all schemes via, via obviously, crypto. Um, the payments to benefits are poor, and if it's good for society, quote unquote, uh, how will they pay for it? So if it's good for society, how will you pay for it? Um, well, that part is really where the idea of cap and trade or net zero commitments comes in, because then you've created uh, either a limitation on supply or a source of demand. Yep. So if I'm a big corporation that needs to reduce my carbon footprint and I've taken it down as much as I can, um, I will be looking for somebody else who can do a little bit more and I'll be willing to finance them mm. and give them the money. So. You know, could that be good for a farmer? You know, there's lots of interesting things being done on the biochar side for use as a fertilizer, where, you know, biochar is made, go back to your high school lab experiments of, yeah. you know, heating uh, organic material in the absence of oxygen, and then you can inject that with fertilizer, soak it in fertilizers, and that's a great way to store carbon away for long periods of time. So there are different aspects where farmers moving to lower carbon processes mm -hmm. could get financing off of that. Yeah. Like that's it working that's well. Interesting. Cool. Now the trouble is everything comes down to quality. So everything comes down to people doing due diligence, working with partners that are effective. And that's part of why we built Base Carbon because we saw a need for, okay, how do you do quality projects um, so that you're making a good market price, providing carbon financing, and not distorting markets and creating more problems. Hmm. And you know, I think your work, you know, the past month or two with FTX has been brilliant, where you know you were the ones having Marco Hodes on and people like pointing out where things aren't working, yep. where due diligence isn't being done. And I think it always comes back to investing's hard, mm -hmm. you know, and people got to put in the work, <laughs> and you know they got to be willing to say this is good quality, this is bad quality, and take a stand on it. So I think that's the fight in the carbon markets is yeah. being able to say. You know, hey, what's good quality? You can buy trash anywhere. You know, it's not just about carbon. <laughs> where no, what you have what I problem. love about that is a super important point is that, you know, carbon markets have tangible things that farmers know about and will ask questions right. about. Right. Shibu Inu shitcoin with <laughs> like some made up token as your collateral right. is not, that's not a real thing. Yeah. In fact, if you actually watch what Rear Vision would say, they would say, well, you don't really need to know about it. You just need to buy it, yeah. right? So this guy actually, made, Arnie made another funny comment and after his question. He says, I think we've, like, I think we, the farmers, have been very efficient, but the carbon preaching crowd claims otherwise. I don't even have a corporate jet. <laughs> 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 That's awesome. It's, uh, it's good. Um, well, we only have uh, time for one more question. And this is a question I wanted to leave for the end anyway, because I was going to ask it myself. But um, for, uh, for people who are not familiar with ABAX, um, 
It sounds really interesting. Can you tell us some more? Who are your partners? Uh, when did you guys start, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, so Josh started putting this together whew, probably at least three, four years ago. Yeah. Um, and, you know, some of the original partners were folks in his network. You know, Josh is a mining engineer by background, so Robert Friedland, Kyle Bass. There are a number of big uh, early investors backing him to it. Those guys are all invested in ABEC. Yeah. Friedland? Yep. Wow. Good. And so, you know, I came in about a year, year and a half ago, and you know, what we're looking to do is we've got a group of guys who I would say are kind of like old school commodity markets folks. So people who worked on the NYMEX exchanges, you know, back in the day, launched Clearport, uh, know how to create physically delivered real contracts, not, you know, shit coins and that sort of stuff, but like real things that serve a real purpose. So we've got those kind of commodity market people, and then we've teamed them up with cutting edge technology people, mm. people who understand how to use blockchain for something other than okay. creating coins, but for a lot of the other good it can do, people who understand uh, making more decentralization in markets, using those tools su to support market function. And I think what makes ABEX really special is we put the two together. So you've got kind of the gray hairs like me who know commodity markets with the people who understand technology, and we're pursuing what we call like a smarter markets vision, mm -hmm. which is we think you can take cutting edge technology and use it to make markets better. Mm -hmm. And by having better, smarter markets that operate more efficiently, you can create you know, better solutions. You get those market-based solutions to the big problems we face, like the energy transition, like climate change, yep. and many others. So that's what we're doing. And you know, I think the FTX headlines, I was a little down before watching some of your stuff because you know, it's hard putting together an exchange. So we've been building really? a futures exchange and clearinghouse regulated by the Monetary Authority of Singapore in Singapore, you know, doing the hard work of creating that from the ground up. And, but that's important because yep. you know, you gotta, markets are about trust. You gotta be able to make sure that your collateral is safe. You know, you gotta have clearing members around the clearing house and the exchange. You know, you need banks that you can work with who are looking over your shoulder, you're looking over their shoulder because you're all sharing the risks that if this thing goes south, everybody's hurting. You can't just have some back door in the code that sucks yeah. everybody's money out. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, our vision is we think markets provide a great way to get people to work together on these big problems, but markets just don't happen. You have to build them. So that's what we're doing through ABEX Exchange, which is our futures exchange that we're launching in Singapore. And when does that launch? Uh, next year. Oh, wow. So we're getting excited. See, it takes, it takes time. It doesn't just happen with like a click no, of a shoe No, it's, 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 it's <laughs> not just code, right? And yeah. it's, but it's, it's the same thing with building networks, right? Because yeah. what we've been doing, like, Josh had the idea, he was prescient about it, you know, thinking that people would be interested in LNG three years ago. I do not think many people would have taken that bet, and now LNG is you know, headline news every day. Um, that's one of the first markets we're interested in, as long with carbon markets. But there was building out, right? It's like going to the commercial participants in the market and saying, what's working for you, what's not? Let's have a conversation. Let's see if we can design a better market so that you know, both the buyers and sellers in the commercial space can feel like they're interacting mm -hmm. in a fair, transparent way that's helping them meet their own commercial objectives. So, okay, you get that layer of who are gonna be the participants. Then it's, okay, who are gonna be the clearing members who those participants work through? through yep. to interface with the exchange. Okay, work with them, get them on board, work with the regulators, get the technology up to speed. There's a lot of interesting parts that come together. And as we head to Thanksgiving, it kind of reminds me of that, you know, like Thanksgiving dinner, yeah. you're trying to get everything on the table at the same time. <laughs> and that's like, that's it, Dinner, that's, that's, dinner's coming. It's really cool. I mean, and uh, I'm really happy for you and for, for Josh, obviously, because it, 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 there's a point where I was interviewing Michael Saylor. Yeah. This is just going to tie what you guys are, have built and are building uh, to what was very different. He said to me, he said, Keith, same, it was a real conversation. Yeah. I still can't believe he did it <laughs> with me. Um, he said, you got to believe in something, man. And I was like, yeah, I believe in my process. I believe in gravity. I believe in, <laughs> you know, it's, um, and, and Crum is always, you can, if there's one takeaway you have from that man, it's that he has a fundamental belief in his process, him and Stefan and you and now you know, this team, he is, he's, on, he's on his path, right? right? And if you believe that what you create is gonna be transparent, accountable, and trustworthy, like you said, like your exchange and how you build it, it's, it's, it's literally the opposite of what Michael Saylor is trying to do, which is just believe. Go to hope.com, trade, you know, whatever he tells you. Like, I mean, 
It's an amazing thing. Belief the, and thinking go together. <laughs> right. They're not separate, right? <laughs> but through all the carnage and all, and I appreciate that you watch the Cahotes, um, uh, you know, you know, conversation. It's just through all this kind of adversity and all this bullshit, yeah. you end up with people believing in the technology, right? And applying it to the to the real world and real world solutions that you know they're there. And uh, how cool is it, man? We got questions from farmers to people that are in markets and. You know, that's real. That's perfect. That's yeah. that's a great conversation and that's building a network. So thank you so much for having us on. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. Thanks. I appreciate it. Great good, to meet you. Pete. Good to introduce you to this guy. It's good to it's good to shake somebody's hand and do these in person. I've been doing them for so long with, the, with just me and a screen. But uh, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it.